just come back and listen. Ready? All right. Um, we are on our last session of the afternoon, uh, views from the judiciary, and we um, are starting a little bit late, but um, we're happy to be here. The only thing I do want to say is we have, we can go into our break, I think everybody would be fine with that since we've just had a long break, but we have a, um, a, a, a video uh, or live stream that we're going to do at 4.30. So I'm going to try to break us off at around 4.25 to make sure that we can get that done. With that being said, our panel participants are Judge Paul Borman at, uh, from the Eastern District, Eastern District of Michigan and Chief Judge John Thunheim from the District of Minnesota. Uh, welcome. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, and uh, what I would ask you to do is make a very brief opening statement since we are running a little bit late and so we can get right into the questions. And we'll start with you, Judge Thunheim. All right. Thank you, Judge. And uh, I appreciate starting late and accommodating me uh, for my uh, slow arrival here at the courthouse. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate all the work that the committee is doing. Uh, this is an important subject, and we're all very interested in the recommendations that you make. Um, I wanted to mention just a couple of things in my statement. Um, the, uh, you know, we have, uh, I think, a very good system here in Minnesota. We're very appreciative of the hard work that our federal defender uh, has done and her predecessor did for many, many years before that. Uh, we have a strong panel and we work very hard at making sure that the panel uh, stays strong. It's changed frequently uh, and uh, we rely heavily on the excellent criminal defense bar in our community to provide services. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention today is the difficulties we have had with uh, the review of the vouchers at the circuit level. I don't know if this is the practice in other circuits in the country, but uh, it's had a significant effect on us here in Minnesota. Um, we've had, I think, over a relatively short period of time, a fairly high percentage of the vouchers submitted uh, by our court have been uh, cut uh, at the circuit level. Um, I've tried to explain uh, to the chief judge that we review them very carefully here, uh, that our federal defender's office reviews them very carefully and catches any, uh, any mistake. The judges review them carefully to make sure that it's not uh, uh, an unwarranted amount of money for what the uh, attorney is, has done in the case. And the review at the circuit, frankly, to, at least to the extent that I'm aware, is simply uh, a review of our vouchers versus vouchers from other districts within the circuit. And it deals very little with the merits of the work done. Um, we can and, and often do write memoranda, additional memoranda, trying to justify the, um, the, the costs that our attorneys have put in for, for uh, reimbursement. Uh, but it's hard to write a memo for every one of them. There's quite a few that go in. Um, and I think standards are perhaps different in our district in terms of uh, the amount of time lawyers put into a case. I mentioned one in my uh, written materials, the, the fact that our detention center is a significant distance away from the courthouse, and it really is about, at least on a good day, it's a 45-minute drive there. Uh, on uh, busy days or days when it's snowing or uh, bad weather, it's a lot longer drive, and there's additional time put in uh, doing that. But... Um, it's a significant amount of dollars that has been cut. And I mean, if this is the practice elsewhere, uh, then I guess we have to live with it, but it doesn't seem to be warranted uh, given the fact that we pay close attention to the vouchers, we review them carefully, we sign off on them, and our review uh, based on our knowledge of the cases is I think uh, well done, whereas at the circuit, it's just a, a look at the amount of money. and an assumption that, 
well, that amount of money is too much uh, for that particular kind of case. And every case has its own unique issues, and we have, uh, you know, the lawyers in our cases are already taking a significant cut uh, to the hourly uh, uh, rate that the CJA panel, uh, CJA Act uh, pays. Uh, and that's fine, and we have no, no uh, uh, disagreement with the amount. It's just, uh, it's another big cut from an already uh, big cut in contribution to the district. So I, I, I don't see the necessity for continuing uh, with circuit court review of vouchers. Um, and I also wanted to mention briefly our uh, mentoring program that we've devised here um, under uh, Catherine's uh, direction where we are training younger lawyers to handle criminal cases uh, in our courts. Uh, it's a mentoring program and a chance for lawyers, younger lawyers who wish to get involved in criminal defense work to have the opportunity to do so. I think it's working really, really well. We pay for it out of the non-appropriated account, so it's not CJA funds going to it, but we have uh, a trained, I think, uh, the number is 20, some 26 or so uh, that have been trained so far to be able to uh, handle cases. And I think that's a, it's, it was a great idea and it's been administered well in our district and we're very proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Borman. Yes. Uh, in the Sixth Circuit, uh, we do not have problems with vouchers at either the Court of Appeals level or at the district court level. And in fact, I know Miriam Seifer, the chief federal defender there, in her presentation to the committee by letter, indicated that she did not want the voucher review taken away from district judges or court of appeals judges. Now, we have a, a court attorney at the circuit court level, Bob Rance, a case budgeting expert, and he's fantastic. Any major case that any district court judge gets, if the person needs uh, interim uh, payments, it's going to be a long case or mega cases, uh, you call Mr. Rance and he sets up a budget and the district judges, if they have questions on vouchers, they can call Bob Rance. But to bring in someone who knows nothing about the case and has not been involved in the case at the district court level to deal with the voucher at the district court level seems to me like you're creating something, at least in, in my circuit, uh, that, that would Im impede the ability to get things processed properly. And I don't think that person would have a feel for the work that the lawyer did in the case. Now, I do echo the concern even more seriously in our district with regard to vouchers increasing uh, because our detention facilities are, in s many cases, two hours away from the Detroit area, which means it's a whole day, which means it's a lot of hours billing for the judges. And I think that one thing the committee should recommend is training new judges at the FJC program for new judges, training existing judges, like we have the judge program that was in Charleston for district judges, and there's one in San Diego uh, later this summer, to tell them that they should be expecting more large vouchers and to understand why. Because there's more mega cases, discovery is increasing in a lot of these cases with regard to audio discovery and the number of documents and terabytes. So for the CJA attorney to do their job, it requires a lot more time. But particularly with uh, the defendants being those who are incarcerated, uh, pre-trial, being long distances from the courthouse to effectively represent your client, you have to go and see them. You can't do it by a phone call. You don't have the protection of lawyer-client privilege. Uh, and also the difficulties of their families going to see them out there. And, you know, hopefully we can work with the marshals to see, but there just aren't beds available. The, the two main jails in the city of Detroit have been shut down because they weren't adequate uh, for housing prisoners, even, I mean, not even, but state prisoners or federal prisoners. On the issue of appointing attorneys, uh, I was the federal defender for 15 years, and now I've been a judge for 22. We have panel 
a blue ribbon panel of experienced federal practitioners who get applications from attorneys and they screen the applications and these blue ribbon lawyers have been in the court a long time, they know who knows what and who doesn't know what and so we have an excellent CJA panel and I think judges or magistrate judges should not be involved in picking CJA attorneys. I don't think a judge should control who comes into his or her courtroom uh, to practice law. Uh, if, if somebody has done something wrong, they can deal with it in other ways, through contempt or other matters, if it gets horrible. But the idea of someone uh, thinking that, well, if I act too aggressively, then the judge may knock me off the panel or cut my voucher, uh, I don't think is, is the way to go. So I, I think that the best way to appoint a CJA panel to make sure it's good lawyers is to have uh, a blue ribbon panel of lawyers, screen them, and also have an administrator within the Federal Defender Office make the appointments and not have magistrate judges or district judges make the appointments and control who gets in or not get, gets in their uh, courtroom to be a CGA criminal defense attorney. The big issue is independence or not independence. And I see my good friend Judge Prado there, because uh, I was a defender uh, 22 years ago when the first Prado was there. And I see they always pick on same the Southern District. I'm the same one. I know, no, they pick on the Southern District of Texas because that's where the people know where, where the rubber hits the road. And they had Judge Cardone now and, and Judge Prado. Uh, it's a Western District, I apologize, right? San Antonio is the Western District. They picked two people uh, to, to go over uh, and chair this committee. Uh, and it's a really important job. And I know by reading, I've read a lot of the testimony at prior hearings. I know what is being discussed. I know the angst uh, that the uh, defender programs and CJOR lawyers are feeling from what's happened to the Defender Services Committee. And I think it's a tragedy. There was sequestration in 2013, uh, but the impact is not over because they still have stripped away from the Defender Services Committee the job that it was set up to do and that it had done for all the years before 2013. They've stripped away judicial resources, has part of it now. The AO has technology. This is absurd. This is like, part of my district includes Flint, Michigan. They have come and appointed emergency managers to do what the Defender Services Committee should be doing. Like in Flint, they appointed an emergency manager and destroyed the water system. Here, having individuals brought in who are not within the Defender Services Committee tells the Defender Services Committee, we don't think much of you, tells the Federal Defender Programs, we don't think much of you, and the CJA lawyers as well. We have a good Defender Services Committee, and I think the AO should restore them to the position like other committees and let them effectively run the program. I know Judge Blake will be chair till October and the Judge Loyer will be coming on as the new chair. These are fine judicial officers and the judicial conference should let the Defender Services Committee be the Defender Services Committee and not pluck away things like resources, technology. Uh, it's very destructive. So it's not like the defenders and CJ lawyers are having PTSD, post-traumatic stress, after 2013 sequestration, you know, and you can say, get over it, but you can't because it's still being marginalized, the Defender Services Committee, and I believe as well, the Federal Defender Programs and the CJA defense attorneys. Thank you, Judge Borman. Um, let's start down at the end um, with Judge Prado, or Judge Ru Dr. Rucker, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Rucker. 
Thank you, Judge Cardone. Sorry, Judge Prado. <laughs> uh, thank you for appearing before us. We appreciate this very much, and I look forward uh, to your responses. Uh, let me start uh, with some issues that we've heard about in our hearings uh, across the country and repeated again uh, both times today, um, and yesterday, I should say, as well. Uh, this has to do with the composition of the, the panel, and one of the things we've heard repeatedly is that the panel is an aging panel. And I wanted to get your thoughts about this and, and see what you think about that, both in terms of, of the panel aging and also the diversity of the panel. And we've heard that you know, the panel basically is composed of older white males. Uh, and I'd like your thoughts about that and, and what do you think we might do to uh, diversify the panel, get more young people on the panel as well. well Judge Tune As I put in my statement to the committee, uh, we have achieved diversity in our panel. And we have a situation where if someone applies and they may not be ready for it, we have like they can mentor with someone who's on the panel and sit in some cases uh, and then come back and apply. But we have, uh, I would say, a good balance of diversity in the Detroit panel. You know, I think it's an it's a excellent issue to, to look at nationally. Um, I, mean, I think from my standpoint, our panel, uh, well, there are, certainly are quite a number of members of the panel that fit that category of older, uh, experienced white male criminal defense lawyers. We have, uh, we have some uh, good diversity that we're trying to build on each year. I think that our second uh, chair program uh, with the 26 new people who have been trained and who've had the opportunity to second chair a case. Not everyone has gone through a trial. Some are uh, obviously resolved in pleas. Uh, but I think that has helped because there's great diversity among that group. Um, they have to apply and be selected. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think we're, we're trying to bring in younger people people that don't have the necessary experience for us to put them on the panel because we don't see that background. Uh, but once they get the training and the experience, uh, the plan is to uh, have these people on the panel and hopefully uh, enable them to represent defendants before us. So I think we're trying to do that through this new second chair program uh, that's, I think, I think we've been running it for three years now, Catherine, is that right? Two or three? It's like a two-year program, yeah. but I, it's, uh, it goes back a ways. Uh, it's probably ten by now. It's yeah. probably it's probably ten years old by now, oh, or nine years old, I should say. Uh, I see. It, it, it's. Uh, I was mistaken. I, I thought that we'd started it more recently, but it's um, it's a program that I think has done quite well, and that's one of the ways that we're trying to address the issue with our own funds. Okay, thank you. Let me turn to some financial issues. Uh, again, uh, we've heard repeatedly around the country that the panel attorneys would like to see higher hourly rates. And uh, sometimes they're talking about considerably higher, sometimes uh, 175 or even $200 an hour. Uh, that has implications then for the statutory maximum for attorney fees. And, and we've also heard uh, concerns about the, uh, what they consider to be a very low statutory maximum for expert rates. Uh, if we did raise the hourly rate for attorneys, that would certainly have an impact potentially on uh, how quickly they could get to the statutory maximum. Uh, do you have thoughts about what the hourly rate might be, uh, either in your districts or nationally as well? And also, what do you think about raising the statutory maximum for which an extended or complex case and for the uh, service provider maximums? Well, I think uh, certainly uh, raising the statutory maximum is something that should be addressed and looked at. Um, you know, everyone's taking a cut to do the work, and we expect them to be as professional and do their normally excellent work in every single case, and they're doing it for uh, less than hourly rates. I don't know that there's anyone who is receiving their typical hourly rate. So any increase, I think, uh, would help because we do lose people, lose attorneys from the program. Uh, sometimes it's because of the voucher cutting. Sometimes it's because of the significant cut in their hourly rate. Um, you know, oftentimes they don't tell us why. They just say, I'd prefer not to be on the panel, and you can suspect why. 
so I think that uh, a, a reasonable increase in the rate and an increase in the statutory maximum would help us with those problems. Yeah, I'm I agree. I think the statutory maximum has to be raised. I mean, it's ridiculously low for experts uh, and, and as well for attorneys in complex cases. And that's when, so then the district judge has to spend more time. If it's not a statutory maximum, then they can sign off and it's done. This way it goes up to the circuit, creates more bureaucracy for the circuit. You're a circuit executive, and I think you have other things that you'd rather spend your time on than working on the vouchers and trying to find a reasonable amount that the person should get, or whether it, it even belongs in front of you since you haven't uh, dealt with a case and the district judge has. So I think that I hope that the committee will significantly raise the expert witness investigator type fees and also raise to some amount the uh, hourly rate that the CJA lawyers get. Uh, I think it, it all goes to the mentality, and I think a lot of the testimony was uh, district judges think that the money that they're giving to CJ lawyers somehow is going to cut the amount of money that district judges are going to be able to have uh, to, to do things within the, the judiciary. And it's not so. I think uh, that... Uh, that, that's a significant point to, to deal with, and it would avoid a lot of the conflict that Judge Thunheim was talking about if the rates were higher and then it wouldn't have to go to the circuit court uh, to get approval every time you want to hire an expert for more than the minor amount that's allowed right now. Would you I, think, I think that the budgeting, uh, uh, the individuals who do the budgeting for the large cases, and we share one uh, with the Seventh Circuit, the Eighth Circuit and Seventh Circuit share. I think that's a great idea, and that has been very helpful. Uh, but we still have the problem with the, the voucher cuts on most of our vouchers that go up to the circuit, the, the, the higher cost items. Well, let me follow up on that, if I may. If we raise the statutory maximum high enough so that it wasn't 10,000, but uh, a higher number so that they wouldn't have to necessarily, as many go up to this circuit, could I ask you to put numbers on that about what you think might be a reasonable number? Well, that's that's a good question. I'm not sure, but I mean, I think raising up to you know at least fifteen thousand would certainly help us a lot because we have a lot of vouchers that fall within ten and the ten and fifteen thousand dollar range that have to go up there and end up getting cut. Yeah, I would second that. We're getting more and more mega cases. There's gang cases. I know other big cities uh, are getting gang cases where they're adding RICO counts and it goes to trial and there's like multiple defendants and just the vouchers, you know, are getting higher. Even our regular cases, when you're plugging in the discovery and the driving distances and uh, the use of experts, so I think both have to be raised significantly, and it will alleviate a lot of the problems that Judge Thunheim spoke about with regard to circuits getting involved. They don't need to be involved, and, and you know, if it goes higher, then it goes up there. I think case budgeting attorneys are a great asset to the judiciary at the circuit level. I don't know if the Ninth Circuit, I think the Ninth Circuit, I think only the Fifth Circuit doesn't have one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you know maybe there's an alternative to uh, being able to have certain cases designated as complex cases, and the the maximum would be much higher there, because that's where we're getting. You know, I, I had one case that involved, uh, a, I think, a close to ten week trial with three defendants, and obviously the bills were very significant there, and uh, I wrote plenty of memoranda to try to make sure that the, uh, the parties, the lawyers weren't cut on that one. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Cardo. All right. Now, Judge Prado. <clears throat> we, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> We've heard testimony at, at several locations from, from various people, and the consensus by, from the defender seems to be that, that, that there needs to be more independence from the courts. And the panel attorneys are complaining about vouchers. Is it some of our colleagues that are 
you know, it seems like neither of your districts has problems, but it's those circuit judges or it's judges in other areas. Is it the judges or is it the system that we have that is the problem? And in, in hearing these complaints and suggestions of, of independence, the judiciary is, is slow to accept change. We all know that. And, and if this were committee were to, to recommend independence, as has been proposed by, I guess, a majority of the defenders, more independence, do you have an idea of, of how it would be accepted or recept would it be receptive, would our colleagues be receptive to such a, a change of, of taking the, the responsibility of, of court-appointed lawyers and public defenders outside of the judiciary, or to what extent should it be taken out of the judiciary, or, or can we fix it within the judiciary? It's always been there since day one, uh, part of the judiciary. We as judges think we can be fair. We have a responsibility to see to it that the Sixth Amendment is, is complied with. Should it stay with us? Should it not stay with us? And if this committee were to suggest that it not be with us, how receptive do you think our colleagues would be to that recommendation? Well, I, I think it would be terrible to go out of the judiciary. I did back in 92, I do now. The judiciary, when it goes to Congress, it is a separate branch of government. Uh, an independent defender system would go to Congress, not be part of the one of the three branches, and would say, we need a uh, billion dollars to defend people that the professor who testified earlier said, people don't like generally criminal defendants and give us a billion dollars. I think that the Congress would not respond positively. I think Congress respects the judiciary. I think the judiciary respects uh, defenders, and I think the judiciary respects CJA lawyers, and they know how important they are within the criminal justice system. With the Defender Services Committee over the last 37 years that I've been first 15 years as the chief defender and then 22 years as a judge, have been advocates for the Sixth Amendment, for the strength of the defender programs and their independence. Uh, and when they go to Congress, Congress listens. It's an equal branch. When a program like legal services, if we were going to be like that, or, or the defender services would go to Congress, I think the reception would not be good. If they ever did something, I think they'd put so many restrictions and controls over it that it would be unable to function effectively as it is now. So I think that the judiciary, all of you and all the judges know the importance of the defender programs and the CJA lawyers with indigent defense. The question is, we have a committee within our judicial conference that represents that program and has represented for the, since it began. And a lot of the judges that came to that committee were not believers. But when they met with the defender uh, personnel and they met with the defenders and, and they experienced every day in their courtrooms, they become believers that to effectively carry out the Sixth Amendment, the judiciary has to be behind it. When they go to Congress, they're judges. They get the Supreme Court justices coming to Congress. When judge advocates come to Congress, things will be good for the defender programs. When an individual head of some program that's split off from any of the three branches comes to Congress, I think the results would be catastrophic. So I'm a strong believer in continuing within the judiciary, but in putting back the Defender Services Committee to its rightful position and to educating judges at programs about the importance of the Sixth Amendment through the Defender Services Committee, the Defenders, and CJA panel lawyers. Uh we're fortunate here in, in the District of Minnesota. We've had, uh, I think, uh, a, a great deal of trust uh, 
uh, between the judges and our federal defender and our defender's office through the years. I mean, we share, I think, uh, an, a really important goal of making sure that the, the program is as strong as it possibly can be, and I, I think that shows in uh, the results that the office and the uh, panel attorneys get in front of our judges. Um, I think some some of our judges probably would uh, would not mind not having uh, the overall responsibility, but frankly, it you know we our goal is to hire you know strong people and then make sure they do their jobs well. The panel itself, we obviously approve that. Uh, and if there's someone that we think is not doing a job that they should, that message gets to the defender, and, and the whole process has worked well. I would be concerned if it were completely independent about the funding, as Judge Borman is concerned about. Uh, I think that the judiciary, in many respects, can protect the program uh, nationally. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I think I can see the I can see the arguments and the the arguments relative to independence. I just think the way the system is currently working works very well for us in the District of Minnesota. So, so what can we do to remedy the problems that we do have? It seems, I guess, the major problem is voucher cutting. Is is it a matter of educating our colleagues about the importance of of giving lawyers the money that? They're, they're due, it, is it a matter of some of our colleagues not getting the message? Some of them think they have a responsibility to balance the budget, I guess, and the way to do it is to cut vouchers. I, I don't know, what do we do to, to solve this problem that we have of, of our colleagues that, that are arbitrarily cutting vouchers without explanation? Or punishing lawyers and somehow, we also hear that some lawyers are taking off the, the panel if, if they look like they're taking up too much of the court's time, or, or this is a guilty plea, you shouldn't get this much money. What do we do? How, do? how do we fix that problem? Well, I think and I hope that what the committee would come out with is a recommendation to restore the Defender Services Committee to its rightful position within the Judicial Conference and to get rid of all the emergency managers that it's throwing on top of that and taking away the role of the Defender Services Committee. With regard to vouchers, I think education is important. I think like at this program in July where all the district, half the district judges are gonna be there, they have to explain to them why the vouchers are going up and what is going on in the system with regard to the number of hours required, discovery and things like that. And to also explain to them that well, we're not saying that whatever uh, someone throws in on a voucher is automatically approved, but the, the, the district judge goes over. But when you go over it, recognize that this is part of the system. It's not taking out the judiciary's money. Uh, it's a separate line. And that they should recognize that the Sixth Amendment requires additional monies and also to train them and say, look, under the uh, program, the, the uh, that red book with all the judiciary policies in it, where it says that the judge should talk with the lawyer, but it doesn't mandate it uh, before they cut vouchers. That's honored in the breach. That's why I think that it should be part of a training program that the FJC puts on uh, every year so the judges understand that it's not just uh, an individual judge doing something, but a judge harming uh, the effective assistance of counsel. I think that's important and I commend uh, Judge Prado for raising it. And I just want to take a minute to commend this committee. I know based on everything I've read and it took me hours and hours to read it, that you have devoted almost a hundred or even more hours to have these committee hold hearings all over the country. And, and I think that shows how seriously uh, the Chief Justice is in terms of setting up this committee and how serious the committee is in trying to write a situation that needs writing and, and that they, they, they have gone to extreme lengths to have all of you uh, be willing to do this. And, and I really commend the committee for, for its, its work. I think that 
You know, at the district court level, education is the answer for judges who think that they are, um, are balancing the federal budget on the CJA program. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's, it's, it's sort of an interesting issue because we're told from the circuit that if we uh, cut a voucher, then that demonstrates to the circuit that we are being vigilant about the costs involved in a case and there would be less uh, likelihood that the voucher would be cut at the circuit. So there's this uh, sort of perverse incentive here to go through and try to find something to cut in the hopes that it wouldn't be cut further when it goes up to the circuit review. Frankly, the kind of circuit review that we get is not really, it uh, doesn't really help the system. It's, it's a comparison between how much it takes for an average drug case in Minnesota versus how much it takes for an average drug case in one of the other districts in the circuit. And, you know, I, everyone has different standards of what they expect. As judges in the District of Minnesota, we expect our panel attorneys and our uh, assistant federal defenders to do a really good job in every single case and to <laughs> diligently represent the defendant to bring motions to ask uh, issues to be tested and not to just roll over. And I think the, the costs are higher as a result. And it's very, very frustrating to our lawyers, I know, and it's frustrating to judges in our district as well to see the vouchers that are over the limit get cut at such high levels. And I don't really see a need for that kind of review. We have a thorough review in the Federal Defender's Office and we have a thorough review from the district court judge. Why is it necessary for another review, which is uh, superficial at best, at the Court of Appeals? I don't understand it. Just one more, one more question. I recall that you were the, the liaison representative for the defenders at the Defender Services Committee, but you were there without a vote. Do you think that if we continue with the Defender Services Committee that uh, defenders should have a voice in the vote on the Hit, hit the, the mic. mic. Uh, do, do you think that, that defenders should have representation and a vote on the Defender Services I, I Committee? I think their presence is important whether they have a vote or not. I don't think it's critical. Uh, but uh, the same like one of the things that's increasing vouchers is sentencing hearings. It used to be you'd come to a sentencing hearing, you'd walk in, and the, there would be allocution, and there'd be a sentence. Now, with the uh, guidelines that have to be figured exactly, because every circuit and the Supreme Court says, first thing you do is figure out the correct guidelines, and that's like a whole s separate series of rules uh, and knowledge that, that people and judges have to be trained on and that attorneys have to be advocating on behalf of the client. So that also takes more time. So that's going to be reflected in terms of the memos and hearings and things like that. But get, getting back, I'm sorry, Judge Prado, get, getting back to your question, I think there should be defender presence at the Defender Services Committee hearings or meetings that they have. I think that's a really critical, important thing. In the old days, they used to have a defender meeting every year of all the chief defenders, and the Defender Services Committee would be there as well to meet with all the defenders. And those were wonderful sessions where we discussed things, and, and they laid out things, and we laid out things, and that was good. I think that is important. I think that should be brought back. One more. Uh, right now, the, the, the public defenders are appointed by the circuit court. Do you see a problem with that system? Should it continue? Uh, should, some, should we have set up some other method of choosing uh, public uh, defenders? Well, I mean, we've been fortunate here. I, I can't complain about the appointments that we've had, and we've only, I mean, we've had I just two in my memory. Uh, and so the process has worked well, and the, uh, there are district judges that are part of the interviewing panel uh, as like the same way we do with bankruptcy judges. So there is a role that's played there, but 
You know, I think that uh, it is it is probably it probably overall would be better for the district court to do it. I don't know what the politics are there. I mean, we're closer to uh, the lawyers who actually do the work in the courtroom day in and day out. We see them all the time. We know who they are. Uh, we know the strengths and weaknesses of various candidates well. Um, I guess I would probably favor uh, returning that uh, go that uh, task to the district bench, district court bench. But I, I say that having not had a problem with what the circuit has done in our district with appointments. Uh, in, in the Eastern District of Michigan, we have a federal community defender where a nonprofit board selects that individual. Uh, but throughout the Sixth Circuit, I've seen other, the public defenders being appointed and reappointed, and I think uh, there's not a problem, because the circuit court usually comes down and talks to the chief judge of the district court and gets the feelings about whether they should do it, maybe not all of them do, about who they think would be the best candidate. Uh, so there should be consultation, and there usually uh, may well be a district court judge on the committee. I know they just recently or appointed a new bankruptcy judge uh, in our district, and the circuit had local bankruptcy judges on the committee that helped appoint the new bankruptcy judge. So I don't think that's a major problem uh, in this situation. I think what usually happens is that there's a, a committee of the Judicial Council, that's the way we do it here in the circuit, who would then interview uh, a certain number of applicants and then recommend you know, finalists, maybe five finalists or three or seven or whatever the circuit wants. And then the circuit bench would do the final interviewing and making the appointment. That's the practice that the Eighth Circuit follows. Now you're done. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> Judge Fisher. I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get a word in here. <laughs> Thank you both for being with it. We all love Judge Prado. Yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> in uh, the various hearings that we've had around the country, we've heard from uh, public defenders and uh, CDOs and district judges about the different relationships between uh, the court and the public defender in this particular district because we have your wonderful federal public defender on our committee. Uh, we know uh, quite a bit about what she does here and you've mentioned uh, some more. Uh, in your district, apparently the uh, public defender manages appointments. You mentioned mm -hmm. she does not want to take on the task of handling vouchers. So I'd like to hear a little bit more from both of you about what your public defender does. Uh, is there more you would like your public defender to do? Do you hear any complaints from the panel members? Uh, any concerns about conflicts, that kind of thing? And um, are, are there pluses and minuses? If you could flesh out the whole relationship for us, that would be helpful. Well. Um you know, I think that uh, we, we are, uh, our bench is satisfied with the overall relationship and the work that our federal defender does. Uh, the office is very careful on conflicts. Um, the office does uh, excellent training for the panel attorneys each year. Um, the judges have complete input. If there's someone on that list that the judges feel is not appropriate, we have, an every, have the ability to talk to the federal defender and that person generally is not going to be on the list anymore or is probably not going to get cases. So we have a good relationship back and forth there. Um, we appreciate the hard work the office does with the voucher system, making sure that there are no mistakes made in the calculations. Uh, flagging issues for us to review. So I'm not sure there's anything more that we could, I mean, or our federal defender has time for anything more 
with <laughs> all of the work that that she does, and, and in addition, uh, carrying a load in the courtroom as well. So we're very satisfied with the relationship right now. You know, with a different uh, federal defender, it might be different, of course. Personalities make a difference, but our court is very satisfied with the way our system works. We don't need to have someone else to come in to do appointments. We don't need to have a magistrate judge oversee the, the process like some districts do. Uh, it's, it works out well, and, uh, and I'm sure that if there were any complaints, I would probably be the first one to hear about it. I have not heard complaints. If there were, or I should say, but for the legislation, uh, do you think your judges would say, why don't we let the public defender do the vouchers, we don't even need to see them, or do you think they would still want to retain some final approval over yeah. vouchers? I think that uh, most of the judges would say, fine, let the Federal Defender's Office review the vouchers. Um, I, mean, I think the, the judges, we do provide, I think, an important role in that process, having been the individual who's presided over everything and has seen what has gone on. So I, I kind of like to have that uh, little bit of oversight. Um, and. Uh, but at the same time, I think most of our judges would probably say it would be okay to give that up. Thank you, Judge Borman. Yeah, we have a community defender program, uh, but uh, it's uh, very, very close to the court in the sense that the community defender does the appointment process, not the vouchers. They have outstanding training programs a couple times a year, bringing in individuals to get the CJA lawyers up to speed, and the criminal law is changing every minute uh, at the Supreme Court level, and it, particularly at the circuit level as well. Uh, on sentencing issues and other criminal uh, issues. So it's important to have the training. They do a great job. We have had, a, a, you know, the, the defender's been there for the last 22 years, and she's, she had worked in, in the office when I was chief as the chief deputy for 17. She is totally respected by the court, and the defenders are, and the judges many times will suggest that an attorney on a case, why don't you talk to the defender office about something, because they have the knowledge of the criminal practice in the district. Do you think your judges would be willing, assuming she had the time to do it, to uh, at least give that first uh, review of the vouchers to the CDO? I, I think that she would be the one that would uh, take away the shoelaces and the belts and stuff like that because <laughs> she's got a lot of work to do, as, as Kathy knows as well, in terms of doing the whole process of running the panel, uh, hearing all the complaints, uh, and, and dealing with the, the cases that are coming out of the U.S. Attorney's Office that are more and more complex and require, like, every week to have, like, eight or ten new CGA lawyers on one case because of the multi-defendant uh, RICO gang cases. So they have a lot to do, and uh, I think the vouchers was something that the, the, the judges heard the cases, uh, and I think we have to educate our colleagues better. I, I'm chair of the Criminal Law Committee in our district, you know, and I at the meetings and at judge meetings, I say you got to understand it's in terms of discovery, in terms of going to detention facilities, the vouchers are gonna be more and, and they should be honored. You. you know, if the question is whether to uh, eliminate uh, judges from voucher review, you know, maybe there's a middle ground too to consider uh, where you know, the, the uh, a federal defender has the final oversight of the actual vouchers, but there's a report on the amounts that are sent to the judges, and if the judge has a concern about the amount, the judge would have the opportunity to uh, look at the documentation and provide input to the federal defender. I mean, that may be a middle ground that could be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Borman, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times the issue of education and educating your colleagues. And I wanted to raise with you the issue of philosophy versus education in the voucher review and the voucher reduction area. Some of your colleagues who reduce vouchers say that it's not that they don't think the work is necessary, it's not that they don't think the work is reasonable, it's that they just 
think that lawyers should understand that they're not going to be paid fully for their work on CJA cases, that they shouldn't expect to. That seems to me like a philosophy issue, not an education issue. Can you tell me your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it is an education issue because, you know, I, I think that they uh, maybe were in private practice themselves before and in maybe 15 years ago, and the amounts were a lot lower in terms of criminal cases, and cases were very simple. You know, there was a plea, a sentencing, and not a lot of work to do. So the groundwork has changed, and I think that it's important to train the judges and to explain to them uh, that this is a new day in terms of what the Sixth Amendment means, in terms of effective assistance of counsel. So you can change a philosophy if you say what your mindset was 10 years ago or what goes in front of you when you're looking and reading a voucher has to change because we need good lawyers to be in the CJA now more than ever where they're multi-defending cases and your office can only take one of the people. We need a lot of good lawyers. And to get good lawyers, you have to pay them what they're entitled to. And they should not be cutting vouchers. And I think that, you know, I would be glad if, if any uh, judge district, uh, you know, wanted someone to come and explain it. I know I was a Pied Piper to try and get some other districts to finally adopt defender programs. There are a couple that didn't. And, and, and now they did. Why didn't we do it 20 years earlier? My God, it makes the judge's job so much easier. Well, having a good CJA lawyer makes the judge's job a lot easier, too. And I think that has to be explained to them. And I think having a Defender Services Committee uh, send out memos to them and also to have each district judge, you know, during the sequestration, it was the chief district judges around the country that went to Washington and said, you got to stop what you're doing to the defenders. That's who was there leading the charge, uh, Judge Preska, Judge Rosen in Detroit, and judges from all over the country, from Los Angeles as well, saying, you're ruining the criminal defense bar. You're ruining the Sixth Amendment. So I think it can be educated. There was a lot of philosophy about people having certain views on a lot of things that's changed in the last 15 or 20 years in this country. Thank God. And I think this is something that the Defender Services Committee should emphasize and get out and get other chief judges, get the chief judges around the country to put that on the agenda of their judges meeting every month. Uh, not, you know, at least, you know, a couple times a year to say this is important to our system or have the head of the criminal law committee explain it to their colleagues. I'm reminded of a, a recent memo by the, or I should say it's been a while now, by the director of the AO where he sent out such a memo to all of his colleagues, circuit judges and district judges alike, saying you shouldn't be cutting vouchers to, uh, to balance your budget. You shouldn't be cutting vouchers just to cut them. And yet we still have the same philosophy that right. it's pro bono work and that lawyers should know that some of it's going to be cut. And so that's why I'm, I'm asking you about the education versus the philosophy issue. Right. It's got to be down at the district court level where not just, we get uh, memos every day from the AO and some we follow, some we don't look at or we think about. But you have to have the AO, Mr. Duff, or the Chief Justice say, look, the chief judge of the district should put it on the agenda for the judges' meeting and explain it to them. You have to do that because there will be a crisis. There is a crisis when they just randomly cut vouchers. So I agree with you 100%. The way you change philosophy is tell people to change their mind on things. They're doing it every day in this country based on the Supreme Court decisions and new laws, and you get along. That's how you do it. You, you deal with it, but not just with a, a toss-away memo. Thank you. I, I think one, just to add to that is, I mean, what is, what is the value that is added to the process by having uh, the circuit court review each of these vouchers? And what value does that add? I think that's the, the way to phrase this and ask this question. 
if they're just looking at them from a superficial standpoint and applying their personal philosophy about whether uh, the work should be more pro bono than it already is, or whether one district is spending more of the federal money for the CJA uh, lawyers than another district is, and therefore they should be equalized. I mean, those are decisions that, uh, or applications of, of philosophy that are unrelated to whether the person did a good job on the case and put in the hours necessary to, to adequately and, and expertly represent a criminal defendant. And, you know, I know, uh, Catherine, you've written many letters over the years to lawyers apologizing for the fact that their vouchers were cut. Uh, I've done the same thing, I'm frankly tired of writing those letters uh, and encouraging the lawyer to stay with the system. I just don't think there's any value being added. There's, there's nothing that is to be gained from having that kind of review as we have suffered through it for the last basically 14 years. Chief Judge Tutum, I also wanted to ask you a question that's similar to that, in that dist different districts have different kinds of cases. And one of the things that we've heard from uh, attorneys in this district is that they're concerned that they are in a district, or I'm sorry, in a circuit, where there are other districts that do not have the same kind of cases we have. They don't have the same kind of white collar cases, same complex cases, the, the terrorism cases. And those are the bills that uh, come out much higher than the cap. If, uh, we were to, uh, if we were to recommend, and, and it was adopted by the conference, that the circuit judges would not review the vouchers. And so the district judges would compare their vouchers against other vouchers in their district. Do you think that would be beneficial, for instance, to, to your district, to only compare the, the vouchers to the other vouchers in your district? Well, I think, I think that would. Um... You know, I think every district has a different standard of practice, and that's probably the way it should be in our country. I mean, it happens, we all have different local rules for civil cases, and some of them vary greatly. I've been involved in the, um, uh, the, the next generation uh, electronic filing system and all the work that we're doing to try to put that together, and one of the chief roadblocks is the various ways that districts do everything around this country. I think the standards are rightly vary from one district to another. It's, uh, uh, the, the base is important, of course, but they, they do vary. I don't, I mean, I think we certainly could do comparisons. I mean, as a defender, you're in a, you're in a good position to make that comparison. As judges, I mean, we can compare it to other cases that we've had. Um, but I still think that the primary look needs to be at you know what is being requested and why it's being requested. I mean, what what are the, what's the work done in the case? And the judge knows the kind of work that was done in the case. The judge knows if there were complicated motions that took a lot of time to put together, a lot of different hearings before a magistrate judge and eventually before a district court judge, uh, a difficult um, difficult issues in sentencing that has, have required uh, a lot of briefing for the judge and maybe evidentiary hearing before the sentence. There's a lot of differences among the cases and uh, it doesn't necessarily relate to, and it doesn't relate to the competence of the attorney and whether the bills are justified. So um, I think we certainly could do comparisons within the district and that would be a better comparison than comparing you know, uh, like the District of Nebraska, for example, with the uh, Western District of Arkansas or the Northern District of Iowa. There's different uh, standards that apply, and I, I, it, it is, it's been hurting us uh, in our voucher review. I don't think anyone, any of the other districts in the Eighth Circuit have had sustained the cuts to vouchers that we have. Thank you. I have one more. You've, you've had quite a few as well. Uh, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. Uh, Judge Walton, do you have Thank any you. questions? need a microphone. I'm impressed with the mentoring program that you have, but how much does that cost to operate? Um, I don't have overall figures. I mean, we approve, uh, it, I mean, it's, it, since there's no appropriated funds for that program, uh, we 
are permitted to use the unappropriated account and our budgets, our, our numbers get fairly high and so we have the money available. I think some uh, have been relatively high. One concern we had for a while is that you know, maybe some of the uh, in-depth work that needed to be done on a particular case was shifted over to the uh, second chair where there wasn't going to be a, uh, a voucher that had to be approved by the circuit. I think we got beyond that. We're being, we, we've got some rules in place to prevent that concern uh, from being uh, realized. But I think a lot of the cases probably run in the maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range overall. I think that would be an average. Catherine, you may know better than me, but I sign off on the on the payments, and they're in stages, so it's always a little hard to figure that out. It's 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 a good program. It really uh, I, plenty of cases that I've had have had the second chair there, and they play a an important role under the mentoring and and uh, tutelage of a very experienced defense lawyer. Thank you. Judge, Judge Warman, uh, I share your concerns about independence and the potential consequences of independence, but the argument that we've received in response to those concerns is that uh, it's felt by some that the judiciary threw the lawyers under the bus during sequestration and that we protected our own interests at their expense. And they also believe that there's an inherent conflict of interest uh, as a result of us reviewing their vouchers. For example, if they litigate a motion to suppress before us that we, we, we perceive to be meritless, that all of the money that they've invested they fear is going to be subject to being cut because we felt that the work wasn't done and they think that that creates an inherent uh, conflict. What do you think about those types of concerns? Well, I, I don't think there's a conflict if the judge understands the Sixth Amendment, and that's why I talk about training for judges on the Sixth Amendment. And yes, you're going to get cases where there's long motions to suppress with evidentiary hearings. But we have that. We're so lucky in the Sixth Circuit that we haven't had voucher cuts uh, for the most part at the, by the Court of Appeals, and the district judges are aware of the fact that cases are complex and they don't take it out on lawyers who do vigorous advocacy. So I don't think there's a conflict. I think that to go away from the judiciary and go to Congress and say, hello, we want a billion dollars, uh, would be catastrophic to the federal defender program. I think that the judiciary, I think what has to be done is to bring, put it back where it was with the DSO. Uh, it, Defender Services uh, Committee uh, should be where Defender Services matters are dealt with, and they recognize the importance of independence. From we're not employees. Uh, I mean, law, CJA lawyers are not employees of the judiciary. They are representing counsel. Defender get paid by the judiciary, but they're not like probation or pretrial officers. They are there to represent their clients. That's who they owe their allegiance to. And I think that the judiciary is aware of it, and that those who aren't aware of it should be made aware of it. And I think the best way to say, look, we can do it right, and we will do it right, is to restore the Defender Services Committee to being the Defender Services Committee. There is no reason for having this emergency manager mentality and taking away really important critical tasks from the Defender Services Committee. Thank Judge you. Walton, just let me add something there. I, I don't, I'm not personally aware of any situation where I think one of our judges has sort of taken it out on a lawyer for being too aggressive. Uh, occasionally there are complaints as judges talk amongst each other. That's certainly uh, possible and if, if someone is litigating frivolously. I don't think a judge would take it out on the attorney. They might call Catherine and say, this lawyer is over litigating. You should consider that in future appointments or whether they should stay on the panel. Um, but I think that in terms of the, the vouchers, I, I've never heard anyone say, well, I'm going to cut that person uh, because they're over litigating issues in front of us. I think 
it, you know, on the civil side, perhaps judges really wish that they could do that in some cases, and all of you probably would agree with that, that some cases, many cases are over litigated. But I think all of our judges recognize the Sixth Amendment, and, uh, and, and even if it, uh, there are many motions brought, it, they tolerate it because that's part of their job to represent the defendants. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Girard? Yeah, I just have one, one question. I see the clock. So, uh, <laughs> Judge uh, Tunheim, I did want to uh, uh, explore with you your value-added uh, concept or, or your question. I share that uh, concern. I think the reason there was circuit review initially was to provide some type of due process, but uh, in fact... Do you have a microphone? I believe so. Am I not speaking into it? Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, in fact, I think maybe the, the opposite is, is happening. In other words, there have been certain circuit interpretations that if there is a voucher cut at the district court level, the circuit court can't review that. And yet, on the other hand, cases are being taken up based on a, uh, a $10,000 cap for uh, extended or, or complex litigation when it's really not extended or complex, uh, in fact. And so it appears that there's not a sufficient reason to have circuit review. In fact, if there is going to be circuit review, it, it should truly be for due process reasons. If a lawyer has been cut at the district court level, and then there may be a district court review or a circuit court review. What, what is your reaction to that? I, I would uh, completely agree with that. I mean, the due process issue is important. And uh, the problem right now, the cir circuit is where the the vouchers yeah. are being cut. It, w in and which no, there is no due process. And there's no due process yeah. at all. I mean, the only, and there's no explanation given other than it is within the discretion of the chief judge to cut vouchers and it's unreviewable pursuant to a panel decision of the A circuit. Well, that that, that's the, all it is. You yeah. see the same thing on every one of them. There's no, no reason given. So we can't say to a lawyer, you know, we're sorry, your bill got cut because we don't know why your bill got cut. It just got cut, and we're sorry about that. Well, that may be the systemic review that we'll, we'll undertake, because it's the Eighth Circuit today. It could be the Sixth Circuit or the Third Circuit tomorrow. I mean, it, it just happens to be the way it, it could, is. and I don't recall any problem before 14 years ago, so I think it's, yeah. it did, or maybe 13 and a half years ago. So I think it depends on the philosophies of chief judges. Right. I don't think even prior chief judges even did the review. They handed it off to probably staff attorneys to take a quick look, and we never had a problem. But then when chief judges took it over, then they decided that they were going to make a statement. Right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Um, it is uh, 4.30, so we are going to, uh, we do have that live stream. But I, on behalf of the entire committee, I want to thank you both for your thoughtful comments. Um, I want to tell you both that if there's anything you'd like to add, having heard from us and some of our concerns, please feel free to do that. We would appreciate it. But um, we thank you. Thank you. And, and please uh, remember, you're all welcome back to Chambers for a little reception afterwards. We'll be there. All right. Great. <laughs> and I just and wanted to thank the committee. Thank you. For getting into this critical issue with regard to defender services and CJA lawyers, you, you are very deserving of, of a great thanks on behalf of the Sixth Amendment. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What do we need to do to... Five minutes? Okay. Five-minute break. It's here. It's going to be right